Okay, I'll probably start the webinar now, and then Alec, I guess when it reaches eight, uh, you could start. Okay. And then I guess everyone else, we're, we're going to go live, so uh, be careful with what you say. All right, good, good morning. Uh, welcome back to the, the last day of WIN 2021. And the, this morning we have uh, a bunch of interesting astrophysics talks I'm looking forward to. And uh, to, to start us off, uh, Anna Banatza, who is a fellow at the Institute for Theory and Computation uh, at Harvard uh, CFA, is uh, uh, she studies dark matter distributions in, in the Milky Way and uh, is going to talk about, well, I, how that works uh, using 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 the Gaia uh, data. So so Anna, uh, please take over. Thank you for thank you. thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. And yes, as Alex said, I will be talking about the studies of dark matter around our galaxy, the Milky Way, with the Gaia uh, data from the Gaia mission. And for the longest time, we thought about the Milky Way as a whole. Uh, as like an ideal laboratory for st dynamical studies of dark matter because it felt like this was this regular galaxy where most of the stars live in this very thin disk, xenon stars, and it looks like it's uh, pretty much in equilibrium. However, after the Gaia mission released uh, the, the data or 3D positions and 3D velocities for millions of stars, we were able to calculate their orbits and find that there is a lot more going on uh, in our galaxy than we expected. And so in this talk, I will be presenting evidence of these dynamical processes still under, uh, going on in our galaxy, and then discuss some implications they have for our studies of dark matter in this environment. And in this universe, we're uh, in a dark matter dominated universe, we do expect some dynamical activity uh, in all galaxies because galaxies, um, at least in part, are predicted to grow uh, through mergers of smaller systems. And so what happens when a smaller galaxy approaches a large galaxy like the Milky Way is shown uh, on the left panel here. So the, and this is to, to scale the disk of a Milky Way-like galaxy in the position of the sun marked with a star. And we can see that as a as these small dwarf galaxies are uh, continue coming in, they're constantly losing stars to tidal forces um, exerted by the, the, the Milky Way itself. And with time, this tidal debris is mixing to form a so-called stellar halo uh, surrounding our galaxy. And after billions of years of evolution, this debris kind of gets mixed, so it's kind of hard to tell apart. Uh, however, if we look at the right-hand panel here in the space of energy and angular momenta, we see that the, all of these 
stars that were originally part of the same system retain similar orbits to the or orbit of the original uh, progenitor dwarf galaxy. And this idea has um, of using the space of energy in our momenta to study the progenitors of the Milky Way galaxy has been uh, introduced a fairly long time ago, almost, uh, more than 20, 20 years ago. However, what we really missed was um, having the data to, uh, to be able to calculate these more conserved uh, quantities like angular momentum and energy. Uh, thanks to Gaia, we now do have these uh, the 3D positions and 3D velocities necessary to calculate uh, the angular momenta of uh, stellar orbits, as well and, uh, as kind of improved understanding of the total matter distribution and the gravitational potential of the Milky Way to be able to calculate accurate uh, orbital energies. And so what I'm showing on the next slide here is work from a Harvard graduate student, Rohan Naidu, who studied the sample of 10,000 uh, stars all the way out to uh, 50 kiloparsecs from the galactic center uh, in this space of conserved quantities. So on the top, I'm showing, uh, or, the, or the top left, I'm showing the, uh, the space of energy and angular momenta, which are again, uh, conserved quantities in an axisymmetric and almost uh, time, uh, yeah, time in, uh, independent uh, system. And uh, on the top right, I'm showing the distribution of eccentricity versus radius. And on the, on the, uh, on the right middle panel is shown, I'm showing the distribution of uh, chemical abundances, which is the alpha elements uh, with respect to the iron ratio on the y-axis and the uh, iron abundance on the x-axis. And so what Rohan did is study the structure of this high dimensional space. And he identified a number of these Milky Way progenitors. So the, the most massive one was uh, previously discovered called the Gaius Enceladus and his smart hill here in yellow. You can see that it, these are stars that are on fairly eccentric orbits and uh, have very little uh, angular momentum. So they're on mostly eccentric radial orbits uh, around the galaxy. Um, and they actually make up a huge part of what what the, the Milky Way halo is. So, so on the bottom, I'm showing the fraction of, of the stars as a function of distance from the galactic center. So moving on, uh, Rohan, as I mentioned, mapped all of these different structures. So another dominant component, at least in the inner parts of the galaxy, is the uh, are the stars that are kind of on disk-like orbits, but some of them that have been Kind of splashed by uh, splashed to to different more halo-like orbits by this uh, uh, kind of merger event that happens ten billion years ago. Uh, another major contributor at the uh, larger distances from the galactic center is the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy and its tidal debris, uh, as marked in dark blue over here. And finally, there are a number of smaller uh, merger events. So these are like. Uh, events like Sagittarius and Gaius Oxygen Celadus make up almost uh, 80 or 90 percent of stars in the in the Milky Way halo. However, there are smaller events that are distinct in both the phase space and also in chemistry as well. And when we continue going forward, uh, what Rohan found is that literally for every star that that we have in our sample, we can tag it or uh, into the the original galaxy that it was a part of when it, before it came to the Milky Way galaxy. And well, this process was um, predicted uh, by simulations of uh, galaxy formation in a dark matter universe, but uh, really uh, or what worked much better than we expected was this decomposition uh, into individual progenitor galaxies uh, with the Gaia data. Uh, and this, uh, this, what this allows us then to do is uh, study how, how these mergers happened originally. And one interesting implication for the studies of dark matter is that now we can constrain not just uh, where the galaxies come from, but on what kind of orbits those uh, satellites were created. And so for this most massive guys and sell this event, Rohan then in his next follow-up paper, um, 
created a dynamical model uh, whose only real constraint was to observe the phase-based distribution or the distribution of angular momenta uh, to the one observed in the data. So here the data is shown with this orange histogram and the uh, blue is showing the, the model histogram and they agree uh, pretty well. And in order to, to match this distribution, Rohan found that the orbit of of the merging dwarf galaxy, even though the merger happened more than uh, 10 billion years ago, it's fairly constrained to a narrow set of orbits. And after uh, following this uh, evolution uh, until the present day, we see that at first, yeah, it undergoes this tidal disruption period uh, where most of the stars are now uh, stripped away from the dwarf galaxy. Uh, but once uh, after uh, five billion years, uh, it starts forming something that uh, looks more like what we expect uh, today. And this distribution is not what we expected. So the kind of common expectation has been that uh, after billions of years of evolution, that this would be a uh, 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 distribution of stars and the associated dark matter that is in equilibrium. However, we can see that even in this uh, time step, um, after 10 billion years, the, the distribution of stars is kind of tilted with respect to this uh, orbital plane of most of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy, which are at uh, z axis of zero. And so this uh, immediately tells us, even though this observation is now in stars, we do expect the dark matter to actually trace this uh, fairly well. So this would have uh, implications that. Uh, and, and then at least in this model, 20% of the dark matter presently in the Milky Way is coming from this merger. And, it's, and it, it looks like it is still not completely relaxed. Uh, so this uh, has then serious implications for uh, studies of dark matter, uh, uh, both gravitationally, but also in, uh, by other means. And you can see this merger is, um, uh, measured to have happened a long time ago, 10 billion years ago. And most of the stars are in this inner part of the galaxy. However, these mergers are continue, continually happening in the Milky Way. And uh, such perturbations are not, uh, or signatures of this equilibrium are not limited to the inner galaxy, but also uh, uh, to the other parts. And most recently, what we found is that the stellar halo, at least uh, at very large distances from the sun, so between 60 and 100 kiloparsecs, is also very highly asymmetric. Um, and we think that this uh, asymmetry, so, so the, the blue here is showing the uh, uh, density map of uh, stars selected uh, based on the, the Gaia uh, and Y's colors uh, to be at these very large distances. You can see that there is one over density here on the bottom left, which is sort of trailing the, the uh, Magellanic clouds, the large and small Magellanic cloud, and another over density on the opposite side, uh, on the opposite hemisphere of the galaxy. And th this is exactly the kind of signal that we expect uh, that this merger of a uh, large Magellanic cloud to be introducing into the Milky Way. So here I'm showing the final snapshot of a simulation uh, run by uh, Nico Garavito Camargo, who is a graduate student from University of Arizona. You can see that this, uh, due to the merger of the large Magellanic cloud, the distribution of dark matter in the Milky Way on this very large scales is predicted to be very highly asymmetric with this uh, two large over densities, one which is the uh, gravitational uh, wake uh, of um, kind of behind the, the, uh, the orbit of the um, Magellanic clouds and this other over density on the opposite side, which is the global response of the Milky Way halo. And these asymmetries have, of course, large implications for kind of our gravitational studies of dark matter in the Milky Way because they change the global uh, distribution of, uh, of dark matter and all of our orbital integration and everything we uh, kind of study uh, uh, the dynamics of stars and, and other objects in the Milky Way is affected by this distribution. But it also has uh, a very, uh, immediate implications for uh, dark, uh, direct dark matter uh, detection rates. And I'm showing here a couple of studies 
that separately uh, analyze the effect of this uh, old guy and cellulose merger uh, first on the left. And this is work by Lena Messweep showing that because this, uh, due to this merger, part uh, of the of the dark matter particles uh, are in a in a colder substructure, and this changes the velocity distribution of dark matter particles in the solar neighborhood, and uh, directly changes uh, as a consequence uh, our sensitivity to uh, dark matter particles of a different uh, of a different mass. So on the in this panel, I'm showing the expected cross section uh, for a. Uh, Xenon dark uh, detection experiment uh, as a function of the dark matter particle mass. You can see that the in dashed line is the uh, standard halo model where the distribution is uh, Maxwellian. And by including this uh, colder substructure, uh, as, which is shown as a blue uh, dotted line uh, to get a total of the of the black uh, solid line, you can see that uh, there's this uh, large difference at uh, lower uh, dark matter particle masses. And similar finding has been uh, done by Bertina Besla, who investigated um, how the velocity distribution of dark matter particles in the solar neighborhood is changed if we introduce uh, dark matter particles from the large Magellanic clouds. And so this is here shown in, in, in different colors and the dotted vers uh, dashed versus solid line is showing just the uh, different models of the large Magellanic cloud here. Um, and basically, uh, the blue is the isolated model, so just a uh, Milky Way on its own. Uh, and uh, the, the orange is the combined uh, Milky Way and large Magellanic cloud. And you can see that there is this, uh, again, a largest difference at low, uh, low masses of dark matter particles. So this is. Uh, still ongoing work and you can see that these are uh, from Rohan's uh, study these are just the, the two events that that have a large impact but what we can do now is actually uh, assess uh, contributions for all the uh, from all the other mergers that that Kaya has provided us evidence for and are and hopefully get a better understanding of kind of what uh, dark matter is doing globally uh, in the Milky Way galaxy but where Gaia also helps us is to understand the small scale structure better. And one way that I like to study dark matter uh, substructure in the Milky Way is using stellar streams. And here I'm showing a snapshot of a, uh, of a simulated uh, cold uh, stellar stream, which is uh, in this case a disrupted, uh, tidally disrupted globular cluster. And the reason why this structure is very uh, sensitive to um, any gravitational perturbations is that it is dynamically very cold. So most of these stars are moving on the on a similar orbit with very little dispersion around it. So that the, and this stream of stars remained very thin. And the second reason is that it has been orbiting the galaxy for a long time. So after uh, as it's orbiting the galaxy, if it encounters a compact object like a dark matter subhalo some stars that are closest to the impact get a velocity kick and change their orbits. And so at this location, uh, this is, there's an opening or a gap in the solar density that evolves and some of these stars are being displaced uh, from their original orbits. So when we uh, zoom in into this impact site at the present day, we see that there is this under density uh, and this uh, kind of uh, population of stars that are veering off of the mainstream. And so, well, this again, uh, similar to, <laughs> to other simulations of galaxy formation, this has been uh, kind of expected to, to occur um, basically ever, ever since these objects were first uh, discovered. However, where Gaia came in is really to allow us to observe uh, the streams at at a high precision to actually be able to see this, uh, uh, these signatures. And on the top panel here, I'm showing our first ev evidence of really significant density variations in a stellar stream. So this is a target of the GD1 stellar stream uh, as observed with Gaia and uh, uh, some also photometric data from the ground-based PANSTAR survey. And so what uh, we found here is that there are prominent density variations in a the stream. There are like two very prominent gaps, and there's also this population of, of stars that is kind of flung out of the main part of the stream. 
and the model that you just uh, saw form in kind of spatial coordinates uh, uh, before is shown projected in the sky in the same uh, observed uh, coordinates on the bottom. And it features the same signature of this density uh, uh, or large uh, under density here, uh, and also a population of stars that, that is kind of uh, flung out of the uh, uh, of their original orbits that kind of matches well the observed distribution of stars in this uh, stream. And the implications here for dark matter would be fairly direct because the uh, properties of this impact are listed on the, on the left. So the impact happened half a billion years ago and the mass of the impact uh, impactor was 5 million solar masses. And so if this indeed is a dark matter subhalo, this would um, there, uh, immediately put a uh, uh, lower limit on the mass of the dark matter particle to be 16 kV. Uh, which is a factor of more than two uh, a higher, uh, a lower limit than what is uh, than the current one from the, the abundance of dwarf galaxies. Um, so this is uh, very exciting news that now uh, with the Kaya data, we, we are able to disentangle the stars that are belong to the stream from other stars in the Milky Way to be able to observe, uh, detect such such signatures. Um, and this is, again, something that we were hoping to be able to do, and, and now that we can. But, but the surprise came the, uh, with the Kaya data in the, the such uh, being able to, to map this impact site in a, in a lot of detail that allows us to extract even more information out of it. And one important uh, aspect here is that uh, we've been able to put some constraints on both the mass and the size of this uh, the, um, Impactor, which can help us then uh, determine between uh, a dark perturber or some other uh, object in the Milky Way. And so I'm in this figure over in the next slide here, I'm showing the, the mass of the uh, uh, impactor object on the y axis and the size on the x axis. And this uh, island of gray is where we ex uh, expect to, uh, this uh, dark matter. Per uh, <laughs> perturber of the stellar stream to lie. And as a reference, I'm also sharing some other luminous objects in the Milky Way. So the circles are the molecular clouds, the, the squares are dwarf galaxies, and the triangles are globular clusters. And dark matter subhalos in a cold dark matter universe uh, are living in the steel band. And the uh, knotted lines are showing the, the one, two, and three sigma scatter off of the main uh, mass concentration relation for uh, these subhalos. So at, at um, face value, you can see that there, uh, that in principle, we uh, need to explain the observations of that stellar stream. We need a perturber that is more compact than naively expected from uh, lambda CBM subhalos. And in principle, it agrees structurally very well with this population of global clusters. However, uh, we, uh, as a part of our modeling, we also uh, varied how close we need this object to come to a stream. And it turns out uh, it needs to come very close, much closer than any of the known global clusters can come, or any of the dwarf galaxies or uh, molecular clouds. So you can kind of cancel these out, uh, which kind of leaves us with this uh, small <laughs> overlap over here, but not, uh, nothing much uh, else. And so our possibilities as to what happened to the stellar stream is now that perhaps this was an unseen global cluster, uh, maybe an unusually dense dark matter subhalo, uh, or perhaps uh, we are kind of looking at the under the wrong lamppost here. Maybe it's not a uh, uh, lambda CDM subhalo, but for example, a uh, fuzzy dark matter soliton core that, have, uh, that uh, encountered the stellar stream. So uh, as a, a Color bar here, I'm showing the expected soliton cores that uh, formed at the centers of uh, dark matter uh, uh, subhalos uh, of different masses. So more massive on the top and uh, lower masses on the bottom uh, of this band. And the coloring is uh, based by the mass of the uh, axion uh, dark matter particle. And for the- Just a, current... a time warning, Anna, you have a few minutes left here. Thanks, very great. Um, and so uh, this, uh, this data allows us really to now uh, constrain uh, structural properties of, 
of this uh, potentially dark perturbers uh, and, and uh, test different models of dark matter uh, by using them. And as a, as a final way of kind of how Gaia data is uh, improving our studies of dark matter substructure in the Milky Way, yeah, we are now not only able to uh, detect that something happened, but even uh, potentially localize these dark matter subhalos. So just to quickly go through, uh, uh, with additional data measurements of radial velocities, uh, precise radial velocities in the stream, we are able to constrain uh, the present day location of this perturber on the sky. And with additional, uh, higher uh, resolution proper motions from the Hubble Space Telescope, we are hoping to even further down, uh, narrow down this location of the sky because now it, it, it is, even though it's it's much constrained from uh, where, it, uh, where it was before, it still spans a large fraction of the sky. So it's hard to, uh, to uniquely identify this uh, object at the present, but the promise is there. And an exciting possibility that, uh, is that uh, we might actually combine different uh, signatures of uh, the, or, or search for different signatures of dark matter. So this would be, uh, or this localization is uh, basically mainly through the, its gravitational interaction with the stellar stream. However, some models of dark matter predict some uh, uh, signatures also in the uh, gamma rays. And so uh, we recently put out a paper uh, based on the Fermi unassociated sources that uh, have spectrum uh, that may be consistent with a, a annihilation of dark matter particles and uh, produce a sample of a few dozen um, candidates shown here in this uh, teal uh, circles that uh, in the future we might, uh, once we uh, better improve our localization, we might actually uh, go look for these coincidences with the, uh, the sources of gamma rays. And this really does appear to be sort of just the tip of the iceberg. This is not a, uh, this perturbation in the stellar stream that I showed you before is not isolated ones. There are a number of examples of other stellar streams that appear also dynamically perturbed. And here I'm going to show uh, three examples. One of the Jalen stream where there are two prominent components and, and maybe some uh, gaps in the density, uh, the tidal tails or polymer five, when again, we see this prominent uh, uh, density variations along the stream. And finally, uh, a combination of streams that were originally thought to be separate objects, the, the Alika Uma stream and the Atlas stream. But after uh, measuring radial velocities in this region, uh, Tingli found that they actually are uh, have uh, radial velocities and orbits consistent with uh, being part of the same system. So there appears to have been something very violent uh, that happened in the past of this object to actually uh, separate the, the streams on the sky today. Of, um, uh, and presumably it might have also been an impact of a the of a for a galaxy or or a dark matter subhalo that that did this. And so finally where we are working towards this and uh, this is a calculation uh, done for the uh, kind of 10 years of LSST data is that we can combine uh, the statistics of stream gaps in, in many streams uh, to constrain the mass of the dark matter particle. So on the x-axis here, I'm showing the expected number of stream gaps in, in uh, LSST data for all of the, uh, for a, a number of streams in the LSST footprint. And on the y-axis as uh, kind of how this number changes as a function of the minimum uh, subhalo mass, dark matter subhalo mass. And so in lambda CDM, or this is kind of a, yeah, like the, the lowest mass subhalo that we're sensitive to is 10 to the five solar masses. So we expect uh, something like 18 gaps in this case. If we detect fewer gaps than that in stellar streams, it means that some of these lower mass subhalos don't exist. And if we detect none, that means that we can actually place some strong limits on the uh, warm dark matter particle mass. Uh, uh, if none of these subhalos exist, then it means that the dark matter particle mass needs to be lighter than uh, 13 kV. So with this, uh, I'll, I'll stop and ask for, uh, <laughs> look forward to your questions. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, a, a question from uh, Anir Ben Das who asks that the change in the direct detection limits due to substructure should depend on the direction of the substructure. It could move the bounds to the right or to the left. Is that correct? Mm. 
Yes, in, pr uh, in principle. So there are there is some directionality uh, involved, and I'm not sure to uh, what extent this has been um, uh, affected here. I, I believe that these uh, were mainly, yeah, looking at the the kind of the absolute velocity. Uh, change uh, in the distribution of, of, I guess, speeds, yeah, uh, and, and not as much in the uh, directionality or not really taking into account uh, directionality as well. Oh, but uh, in principle, uh, we, we now do have uh, those spatial informations as well. So I think there is a lot of work to be done to improve these uh, calculations. And I think this were kind of, uh, done more as a teaser to see that, uh, that there is actually an observable effect here uh, due to the substructure. One uh, a question on, on, on the data. So the, the magic of Gaia is that it gets you precise distances and proper motions uh, out to distances we've never had before. What, out to what distance does that work? Right, that's a, that's a great question and it, it comes in a variety of uh, answers. So for more, most of these, uh, for example, uh, stars that, that Rohan analyzed here all the way to the 50 kiloparsecs, or, right, or the sample goes to, to 100, our sample goes to 100 kiloparsecs. Um, uh, the Gaia provides very precise proper motions, but the distances are not, not very good, basically beyond one kiloparsec from the sun, the distances are, are not that good just from Gaia. But uh, Gaia combined with other inf uh, information, or at least for most of the, the stars, uh, like if we have spectra, we get uh, pretty precise distances uh, all the way up to 100 uh, kiloparsecs. Um, but this is just for kind of regular stars. There are a number of, uh, kind of stellar populations uh, that, that we can calculate their distances through other means. And, um, and for those, we can basically look, uh, use Gaia throughout the Milky Way halo for, for the most luminous of them, like the, the K giants here that, that, we, that we used in the study to, uh, to set the structure the, of the outer, um, uh, outer halo as well. It's just, I think that beyond 100 kiloparsec, it become like the, the main issue is the, uh, scarcity of tracers, like the, the density drops off uh, very fast. So, so that's, I, I would say, uh, the, the limiting factor, but probably within 100 kiloparsecs, we, we have uh, pretty good sample sizes. 